Right. Good morning. I wonder if you know what the topic is going to be today. No, I'm not preaching on the Bengals. That's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It is Super Bowl Sunday, like Pastor Tom said. First of all, welcome to everybody here today. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so thankful that you're with us. And uh, I do have a question. What is, I just want to take a straw poll. What's your favorite part about the Super Bowl? Is it the game? Is it the halftime show? Is it the commercials? Is it the, the food? It's what? The food, okay. The food is your is your, okay. The food is your favorite part. All right, all right. Well, some people, it depends, right? It depends on who's the halftime performer. It depends on whose team is in the game right now. Like this year, I'm more interested in the game than anything else, right? Right. But in past years, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm interested in the game, but I'm also interested in some other things. If you're online, let us know in the comment section. Let uh, let us know what you're looking forward to tonight. Uh, I love that uh, that commercial. Uh, that's probably one you won't see tonight. Uh, there, here's another one. Here's another one that you probably won't see tonight, but. I think it's worth uh, was showing us today because I think it kind of creates the spirit of what we're trying to do today for Super Bowl Sunday. Take a look. I have a pretty good life, but there's this nagging problem that I don't really <laughs> like to talk about. I had that exact same problem, but mine was way worse. Here's what you need to do. Make sure that when you're in a place you that need to look nagging like you're problem. Hey, this is it. What do we say about the drinks? Round them up. If you suffer from know-it-all friends, bossy family members, or co-workers with loud opinions, you might be experiencing a condition called correctile dysfunction. Here, here, watch. Hey, honey, you want a drink? Please, tell me more. Introducing Know-It-All, an easy-to-use mist that cures correctile dysfunction. Tell you, I don't understand why you don't listen to what I'm saying. I've tried to tell you like three Liberally times. spray Know-It-All in the direction of your symptoms and watch them dissipate. What I meant to say was that Sounds really hard. <laughs> know it all cures a variety of symptoms like irritation at work. Hi, so I know you didn't ask, but I went ahead and made a couple notes on your presentation. I started at the beginning and then it just kind of flowed from there. I mean, the whole thing. Know it all instantly relieves that pesky contrarian pain. Boy, what are you doing taking the interstate? Everybody knows the back roads are faster. Know it all works quickly on all sorts of nagging symptoms. You know, you're the only ones that haven't given me any grandbabies yet. Side effects may include coughing, empathy, diarrhea, listening skills, eventual death, kidney vomiting, 24-hour scurvy, night blindness, day blindness, and scabs. But who cares? It won't be your problem. You know what? You don't need my help. I think I'll just quietly enjoy the ride. I can be a real windbag sometimes. Correctile dysfunction is curable. Talk to your doctor today about Know It All. It tastes like schnapps. There's always some obscure, you know, medical-related commercial in these in these uh, in these games. And uh, yeah, I think I might need a bottle of Know It All for sure uh, from time to time. I think it would be useful. Well, today we are continuing our series called Unthinkable. We're in week six of our series, Unthinkable, and we've been talking about a lot of different uh, habits and attributes that we can have to live an unthinkable life. We talked about doing hard and challenging things. We talked about the priority of prayer. We talked about some of these, uh, these habits that we want to develop in our life, like forgiving easily or giving generously, serving sacrificially. And today we're going to hit another topic that may be kind of the linchpin, maybe the biggest one yet. All of these things are very, very important. You need them all. Uh, if you do hard things, people will take notice. If you create habits that lead to success, uh, you know, in, 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 our, in our spiritual life, in our, in our, in our, our day-to-day -day life, like prayer, forgiveness, generosity, serving, that can take you far, but there is one thing that you need in addition to all of that. And that one thing that can take you from being successful to unthinkable, and that's what the topic is today. It's, we're going to talk about perseverance. Because some of us, we need to look at, okay, how do I just kind of keep going? How do I just kind of keep going when times get a little bit difficult, when it gets a little bit um, just, just hard, when, when we actually try to do those hard things, they are challenging. So it's important that we actually can kind of work our way through it and see through it to the other side. And so this attribute is going to be best displayed uh, from a biblical context, I believe, in the life of the Apostle Paul. We see in his life, he goes through a whole lot. And it's not that other people didn't go through a whole lot. Paul was just, you know, louder about it. And we know more about him, about the struggles that we went through. But so, and so we get to walk through kind of a little bit of his life today. Paul was 
born Saul. He was the quintessential Jewish leader, for those of you who don't know. Uh, he was beyond zealous. He was ambitious. He was passionate about eradicating uh, this, the world of this new movement sparked by the resurrection of Jesus called the way. His whole idea was, we got to get rid of this thing. We got to eradicate, we got to eliminate these people who are saying Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God. We got to get rid of them. And so he went out looking for them. He went out hunting them down and killing them. And then his life changed forever when he actually encountered Jesus. His life, like mine and, and many of you, is a testament to the transformative work when you encounter Jesus, when you connect with Jesus. A miracle happened, right? Paul had to first convince. Think about this. He had to first convince after this miracle happened in his life that, that those that he was persecuting, that he was now on their team. He was now on their side. Like that, that couldn't have been an easy conversation. I know I've been trying to kill you, but trust me, I'm on your team now. Right? Like it's, it's not really, that would have been a really hard conversation. No easy task. That his personal mission statement, he had to convince them that his personal mission statement had so radically changed to now be an ambassador for the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. And he did this for a long time, right? As you can, ima as you can imagine, he had to do, it wasn't just one conversation that he had with people, right? It was an endeavor that he continued to pursue. And after convincing the apostles, he kept going uh, with this and started churches all throughout the Mediterranean rim. And most of the New Testament is written by him through the letters that he wrote to those churches that he started, equipping and correcting and teaching about the ways of Jesus and the kingdom of God. And, but this new mission wasn't really easy. He actually describes uh, his, his hardships, some of the things he went through. Uh, in one of his letters to the Corinthian church, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, and beginning in verse 4, he says this, In everything we do... We show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten. We have been put in prison. We have faced angry mobs. We've worked to exhaustion. We've endured sleepless nights and gone without food. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us impostors. We are ignored, even though we, uh, even though we are well known. We, live, we are close to death, but we are still alive. We've been beaten, but we haven't been killed. Our hearts ache, but we have joy. Like he goes on, like, come on, Paul. Like if you had a friend who kept on saying this, there would be part, like you might need some know it all, is what I'm saying. So like, okay, and, like, and then you, when you actually listen to him, like, okay, that, that seems really hard. How did you go through that? He didn't stop there. Just, just a few chapters later in 2 Corinthians 11, this is what he says. He said, I've worked harder. I've worked harder. I've been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number. I've faced death again and again. And he starts to actually specify, you know, of what, what he did. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a day and a night adrift at sea. I have traveled many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities and the deserts and on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers and are not. I have worked long and hard during many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, and I have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, if that wasn't all you know, enough, besides all of this, I had the daily burden of the concern of the churches. That last little bit I, I find funny because I'm just like, you know, I feel like that, that part shouldn't have been highlighted. Anyway, so that's just me. Like, all right. This was at the time of him writing this. was about 55 A.D., 55, 56 A.D. He still had another 11 years of his life and ministry before he was martyred. He, he endured all of that, and he still wasn't the last hardship he would see. It wasn't even the last shipwreck he would see, right? He talked about how he had, he was shipped, he, three times he was shipwrecked. It happened again in his life. And, and, and when things start happening to you, I don't know if you, you know, like if something really traumatic happens to you and you get through it, the next time that thing happens to you, you can go one of two ways. You can kind of be like, oh, man, this, I thought I was just over this. Or you can be like, I know what to do to get through this now. I know what to do to get past this now. And in Acts chapter 27, we see this another account, this event that Paul is being taken to Rome. 
He's kind of relented that I have to go face this Roman government and I have to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be arrested as soon as I land uh, you know, in Rome. But I'm going to do it anyways. I know I'm supposed to do it anyways. And so he, and he believes and he's been assured that he is going to make it to Rome safely. Well, on his trip to Rome... In Acts chapter 27, it says, A light wind began blowing from the south, and the sailors thought they could make it, because all sailors do. That's why we have shows about sailors who think they can make it. Um, But the weather changed uh, changed abruptly, and the wind of a typhoon strength burst across the island and blew us out to sea. This is is kind of Paul accounting his his event. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the the ship, the crew began throwing cargo overboard. They threw gear overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. I don't know if you've been into a circumstance in your life where you just felt like all hope was gone. It just hits you repeatedly over and over again until you just feel like, I can't take it anymore. That wasn't Paul's feeling. That was everybody else on the ship's feeling. He goes on to say, no one had eaten for a long time. And finally, Paul, who was the prisoner on the boat, calls everybody together and says, guys, if you guys would have just listened to me and not say, then we wouldn't have gone through all this loss. And then he says, guess what? We're going to make it safe. The, the God, in all his goodness, has granted us safety, he said. I have been encouraged. I believe God. It will be just as he said. We will be shipwrecked on the island that we're going to. So it says about midnight on the 14th night, they were driven across the Sea of Adria, and the sailors sensed that land was near. And they, they, they were so worried. They are like, you, you, they were trying to still thinking that we need to abandon the ship. Life, uh, they lowered the lifeboats uh, to kind of get those things out there. Uh, at the end of the story, basically, the ship is shipwrecked. And it says this at the very end of Acts 27. It says, the, the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape, but the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard and make for land. This is, inter- this is so crazy. The others held on to planks or to breeze from the broken ship, so everyone escaped safely to shore. Sometimes God gets you to where you need to be on the pieces of broken ships. Sometimes it's not just, I got to get through this and it's going to magically disappear. It's that I got to walk through this and it's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard and I need to persevere. Paul goes through this, this, this encounter in his life. This happened after his account and that, he, that he put uh, his letter to the Corinthians. But in the letter to the Corinthians, he says this in, in chapter 4. He says, we're pressed on every side. This is encouragement, right? We're, we're, we're pressed every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. This is the essence of per- perseverance. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. Like this is the cheerleading, this is the, the pregame speech that Paul has given to us today. Maybe it's halftime speech when you feel down and all hope is lost. Hey, we're, we're pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Though suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but all of this, Paul says, is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be a great thanksgiving. There will be a great overcoming. There will be a great celebration. And God will receive more and more glory that is why, he says, we never give up. The first thing I want to talk about today with perseverance is that we don't give up, we get up. And that's easier said than done, right? We don't give up, we get up. When, you, when, when life just hits you repeatedly and it just feels like all hope is lost, sometimes we have to keep, keep telling ourselves, hey, we're pressed, but we're not, you know, we're not crushed, we're perplexed but we're not in despair. We may be hunted down, but we're not abandoned by God. We don't give up. That is why we don't give up, Paul says. We don't give up, we get up. Take a look at this story from Carolina linebacker Thomas Davis a few years ago. For me, it was all about, God, why is this happening to me? The 
in the off season, you know, I do a lot of work in the community. On an off day, I'm volunteering to help the kids out, encourage them to not be afraid to come in and get the screenings done. I get the screening done to get the kids excited, and then the doctor says, oh, you have a condition. Find out that I have an abnormal coronary artery. They say you find this out two ways by doing the procedure that I had done, or you find out through an autopsy after you've already passed. My heart dropped, you know, just fell into my stomach, and I'm not even thinking about football. I'm thinking about my husband having a heart condition. Come to find out, no one has ever come back from open heart surgery to play the game. Let's pray about it. You know, maybe, maybe you won't have to have it. And there's like three doctors, they're telling us that's not an option. He's gotta have open heart surgery. We prayed about it, you know, asked God if there's a way to prevent me having to have surgery. So we send the test results to Emory, we send it to Cleveland. They came to the conclusion that if something was gonna happen to me and I was gonna pass, it would have already happened to me. You don't just go from one day to them setting up a surgery to two days later to, oh, you don't have to have surgery. I know that that was God. Best season of my NFL career. Halfway through the season, we're playing in New Orleans. Make one simple move, break to the right, and my knee goes out. Drew Brees is taking the Saints down the field. I gotta figure out a way to get back in this game. But at this time, our trainers, they knew that it was ACL. It was one of the worst experiences ever. You know, going from, you know, playing extremely well, being at the highest level and you know, to be humble, just like that in one single play. Go on, have surgery. The knee has recovered well, I'm strong, I'm fast. First day back doing the linebacker drills and feel the same pain in my knee that I felt in New Orleans. And instantly I knew. I rehabbed that second knee injury. Come back two games into the season. They're making a drive, I go to make a tackle. One of our linemen doing his job, they ends up leg whooping me. It's the third ACL. It's torn again. Three ACL tears in three years. I didn't think that I would continue to be able to continue to play. In this game, guys don't get that opportunity. I had to be strong. The only way that I could do that was to talk to God, was to pray to God. And if he needed to cry on my shoulder, then that's what, let him cry, let him get it out. And once he got it out, it was no stopping him. <laughs> it was no stopping him. God strategically set all of that up for me to win the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, for me to be a light to them, for me to display everything that had gone on in my life for someone else to see. And whether it motivates one person or a thousand people, it's all been worth it and I wouldn't change a single thing that has happened in my life. God knew that by this happening to me, I could motivate other people to continue to want to fight and want to push through the injuries or whatever they may face in life because it's, it's already been written. You just have to follow the process, be willing to stick it out. You have to be obedient and you have to listen to God. So don't give up, get up. It's incredible that, that somebody who's had to face open heart surgery and then ACL tear after a ACL tear after ACL tear and try to keep on coming back from that when nobody else has ever in history. I, I can relate. Uh, I tore my ACL um, playing community, uh, you know, recreational indoor soccer. And it's, it's kind of the same as NFL football. I don't know if you know that. But it, it is, it's the same level of athletic preparation and commitment. Um, but no, I did tear my ACL. And it was, it was amazing to have to come. I can't believe you know, somebody at his level trying to get back up and get back up and get back up. And yes, he's got uh, great doctors and stuff. But it's still, 
uh, you get knocked down, you get knocked down, you get knocked down again, and some of you are kind of going through that too. Paul went through that. In Philippians 3, he says this. He says, I press on to possess the perfection uh, for which Christ Jesus has possessed me. There's, a, there's, a, there's an attitude of, I got to keep going. Yeah, I've been through all of this five times that this happened to me, three times this happened to me. I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, I've been in prison, I've done all this, but I press on. He says, I haven't achieved it, but I focus on one thing. I forget the past, and I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to win, to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Now, when you, when you think about the unthinkable life, I think perseverance is a key attribute that we have to put in a key habit that we have to equip in our arsenal to be able to get through this and to be, uh, to be living an unthinkable life. In fact, this is from the, the, the book that, you know, the research that we've been kind of providing you through the Unthinkable Journal. This is kind of what is said in that. It says, there is a popular mountain among hiking enthusiasts and more casual climbers alike. It has wonderful view as you ascend, and while the ascent is quite difficult, the view from the peak is spectacular. For those who choose to climb it, the journey is possible if the climbers stay focused and persevere. Climbers sit on the trek to the top of the mountain, totally energized. However, about a quarter of the way up the mountain, some of the challenges of the climb begin to set in. The altitude makes it difficult to, 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 to breathe. The energy spent to create, uh, begins to create an intense hunger, hunger. And the cold temperatures cause hands and feet to tingle and begin going numb. But halfway up, there's a mountain lodge. It was built there so people can catch up and they can rest. Halfway up the mountain, people can grab a great bite to eat and get a quick warm-up by the fire. And from the comfort of the, of the lodge, people can see travelers and gaze to the top and watch people climbing as they're passing by, continuing toward the peak. But an interesting thing happens. According to a study at that mountain lodge, two-thirds of the people who set foot inside the lodge never reach the top of the mountain. They never keep going. Why? Because it happens when people kind of stay in the comfort of the structure for too long and become comfortable. They, they can't get through the hardship again. The cozy lodge which did, with its soft furnishings and its blazing fire and other amenities caused most travelers to take their focus off the initial pur purpose and lose sight of their chosen goal. Because the word mediocre literally comes from the Latin halfway up the mountain. No one wants to be called mediocre. No one wants to set out to get to the top of a mountain and, uh, and, and, and to be content with just stopping halfway up the mountain. But it happens. It happens. And the important point part of perseverance is that we have to find that other gear. We have to not give up. We have to get up. Because here's the second point I want to I highlight today. Setbacks are just setups for comebacks. Comebacks aren't easy. That's why they're special. That's why they're notable. That's why people take notice for, this, for, for, for comebacks. That's why we hear a story like Thomas Davis and we're like, you know, that's incredible that you're able to go through all those challenges and come back from that and do something uh, just, just incredible in, in your field. Setbacks are simply setups for comebacks. Peter had a good, pretty good comeback story. Right? He's the inner circle disciple who betrayed Jesus. It was devastated as a result. He was like going back to being a fisherman. He's like, you know what? I'm giving up. I messed up. I failed. I'm, I'm a failure. He was giving up thinking he didn't pull through. And then what happens? Jesus meets him again. He encounters Jesus again after the resurrection and invites him once again. And, and Peter doesn't let this encounter, doesn't let this opportunity go to waste. He becomes the leader. He becomes the spokesperson for the movement of the beginning of the church in the years to come. And Peter says in, in his letters, he says this in 2 Peter chapter 2, he says, make every effort to respond to God's promises. He says, supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. And, and to moral excellence, supplement that with knowledge. And supplement your knowledge with self-control. And supplement your self-control with patient endurance. Peter knew it takes perseverance to get to do something unthinkable. And you think that your past disqualifies you from a relationship with Jesus? I hear that a lot. I hear people say a lot that, man, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what my past is like. You don't know what I've gone through. 
Here we have Paul, a guy who hunted Christians down and had them put to death before he became one. He even says, because of that, I'm the very least of all the apostles for that very reason. And we got Peter, the guy who walked with Jesus and betrayed him to his face. When Jesus seemingly needed him the most, Jesus met both of them again. He met both of them again to let them know that they still belonged, that they still had purpose, that God still loves them and still wants to have a relationship with him, with them. And if they could get past their past, if they could endure through the awkwardness of the immediate, of having to like go back and and see the people again who in Paul's case he was hunting down and in Peter's case he betrayed he had to get through the awkwardness of the immediate then they could do the unthinkable for the kingdom of God that setbacks are just setups for comebacks so there's a recipe to unthinkable perseverance i'm just going to rattle some of these off uh, uh, for us today. I believe that if we, there's, there's a combination, there's a recipe if you're looking at, okay, what does perseverance entail? What kind of goes into that? Here's where it begins. It begins with a hope. It begins with hope. We, we need, you need to have a hope in order to persevere. If you don't have hope, then, there, then you're going to give up real quick. You need to have a hope. Without hope, depression and defeat usually win. They usually win. So you need to have hope. You also need to kind of turn that hope into belief. It becomes a little bit more of a, of a stance, a little bit more of an entrenchment of belief. You have to have a deep conviction to be willing to persevere. It's not so, you're not going to persevere when you just kind of halfway believe something. You're not going to go through the challenging times or the hard times or the difficult seasons when you're like, you know what, I'm not sure if this is worth it or not. You have to be deeply committed into a belief that this is what it's going to take. It has to be something deeply important to you to be willing to continue to fight through. So you need hope. You need to add belief. And then if you have that belief, if you have that deep commitment, if you, have, you, 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 are, you are deeply convicted about something, you need to add to that determination. You need to add to that determination. Paul said in his letter to Timothy, who was a, a mentee of his, he was mentoring him and, and, and being a, a Christian leader, he said, I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and glory to Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. I'm willing to do it. I'm determined to do it. I've determined in my mind that whatever comes my way, I'm going to get through it because I, there's a calling, there's a belief system I have. I'm determined to do it. You need to add determination. And when you need to add to determination, you need to add focus. Focus. We just talked about the mountaintop, getting halfway up the mountain, and, and we, people lose their focus. They lose the, 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 you know, what they're looking at. They lose the goal and the vision of what they're trying to accomplish. And, but we have to be, maintain focus. Perseverance happens when we choose to walk daily in obedience to Jesus no matter what comes our way. It's long obedience in the same direction. It's, it's, it's the idea that we have, we have a vision for it and we have to stay focused on the goal. On the prize. Paul said, I press on for the prize. I press on to finish the race. He had the goal. He had, and he stayed, maintained focus. Hope, belief, determination, focus. Grit is the next one. Grit. Angela Duckworth in her viral TED Talk talked about grit. She said, grit is passion and sustained perseverance applied toward long-term achievement. With no particular concern for rewards or recognition along the way. Grit is passion and sustained perseverance. It combines resilience. It combines ambition and self-control in the pursuit of the goals that take months, years, uh, uh, even years, maybe even decades. And what she kind of goes on to talk about is that talent doesn't make you uh, gritty. That things, that, that things change really with efforts. That talent can only get you so far. That we, you may have a talent, you may be good at something, uh, but it takes a different level of grit, it takes a different level of effort to actually accomplish something great. To be unthinkable, to have unthinkable perseverance, you need to have hope, belief, determination, focus, grit, and we just kind of hit on this a little bit with grit, but it's resilience. Resilience. Resiliency is the ability to keep going, keep believing, to overcome harp- obstacles uh, and hardships, or even traumatic events or news in your life. Take a look at this story from Kirsten and DeBricka Shaw Ferguson.
A friend of mine was his publicist at the time. Um, she wanted to uh, all go out one night. So I said, sure, let's go. You know, I saw Kirsten. Uh, I knew as soon as I saw her, I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to you know, try to get at her a little bit because, you know, she was nice. It was just easy and fun. Kind of all the things you dream about as a little girl, you know, you meet your husband, the love of your life, and you move into a beautiful home, and then you have children, and you kind of live happily ever after, and that was kind of my mindset. I knew that I wanted children one day, but that one day wasn't that day. We got pregnant, and it was like, this is what was supposed to happen, you know? We went in and we saw the ultrasound and I'm just chit-chatting with the girls that are doing the ultrasound and then all of a sudden it, it went quiet. And you know, my doctor told me, you know, by this time you should definitely see a heartbeat. And, but there wasn't even, there wasn't even a baby. It was, it was, there was nothing. The intense pain just starts, and it's full-on labor, basically. So I'm screaming, Brick is running up and down the stairs trying to get me, like, hot pads for my stomach, and the baby passed while he was downstairs, and I just remember screaming his name, and he comes running in, and it looks like a murder scene in our bathroom. Like, she's very, very weak at this time, and I'm like, well, I have to be strong because we're supposed to lean on one another. Brick lifts me up and he says, don't you dare look in that toilet, and he flushes it. He's like, that's not where our baby is. God had shown up in my life before, and so I knew that he was real, and I just knew that this was one of our trials. I was just focused on having kids, and I was like, Brick, you need to get on board. And he was like, I'm not ready. So there was just so much attention on having a child. There was so much attention on this vision that I was not seeing the same way. I think as we talked to the counselors and kind of laid out how we were feeling, it kind of quieted down a little bit because we finally felt heard. It was a rough time, but I feel like that six months, we needed that six months. At that moment, we finally were able to plan something together. And we got pregnant the first time. We were planning our trip to Israel, um, so my doctor was like, before you go, you know, I think everything should be good. She just wanted to check on the baby and make sure everything was fine before we left. So we went in at um, eight and a half weeks. The lady, you know, put the gel on, and I look at the screen, and there was no heartbeat. The baby was just lying at the bottom of the sack. And uh, that was really hard. It was really hard, and I remember saying, like, There's a, keep checking, like, make sure. And, and, but there was nothing. The baby was just... I was angry with God. I was mad. I, I just, I couldn't understand it. It was so hard to just live everyday life. The hardest day for me was we went to church on Mother's Day. The pastor asks all the moms to stand up and she gives every woman a rose that stands up. And that feeling of having to stay seated was so heartbreaking. Like I said, church started to be a really hard place for me. So it was one of those days and um, I was tearing up and, and a, a random woman came up to me. I had no idea who she was. She didn't know who I was. I was trying to kind of just stand off to the side a little bit. Um, and she said to me, God has not forgotten you. And I was blown away, blown away. And I just broke down and she's like, oh, I didn't mean to make you upset. I was like, you have no idea what those words just meant to me. And I 
remember just having hope in that and just saying, okay, God, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I know you're still there. And I got pregnant. I felt more prepared. I felt like, okay, I'm ready for this step. It was like an exciting time, but it was also very scary because I'm like, this is the third time. We've been here before. I don't even know if I have words that can describe the joy I felt. I didn't know how to feel, you know, I'm like, there was just so much, uh, I was overwhelmed. It was just like, of course it's you, of course I was waiting for you. Perseverance isn't really about just climbing the physical mountaintop. We talked about that. It isn't climbing your kind of professional or your career mountain. It's not about, you know, it doesn't always have to be about those things. It can sometimes be just about life, right? It can sometimes be about what is happening in your life right now. And the reason that story just kind of speaks to, to me and I think speaks to a lot of us is because it's real life. It is something that a lot of people go through. It's a, but it's an opportunity to be able to do these things and live the unthinkable life when we can persevere through some of those really challenging, hard times, when we are able to be resilient in the, in, the, in, in the face of obstacles. We can keep going. We can keep believing what God has for us, even though we go through sometimes traumatic events or news in our life, that we have the hope and we have the belief and we have the determination and the focus and the grit, and, and, and we need to be resilient in that. And then once we're resilient, we need to kind of keep after it. We need to have like this sense of tenacity that kind of goes along with persevering. We gotta keep going and keep after it. Like this is something we're going for, and not just and not just something that we add to the hope and the belief and the determination, the focus. We have our vision, but we, and we're gonna be resilient. We know no obstacles are gonna come, but we're gonna attack it with tenacity. And the last little bit of this is endurance. We've talked about this a lot already today. It's endurance. James and James chapter one says, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, and his advice, his encouragement is to let it grow. So let it grow. Because when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, not needing anything. In fact, another translation says, consider it joy. Consider it pure joy when you face trials, which, like, that's just anti-whatever we are feeling in the moment, right? Like, that doesn't make any logical sense that we should be thinking about trials and, and hardships with a, with a lens of joy. That's what makes this kind of life unthinkable, is that we can consider trials uh, and, and, and just tribulations and, and all kinds of things as joyful experiences because the testing of your faith produces perseverance, it says. Let the perseverance finish its course, finish its work so that you can be mature and you can be complete. It doesn't say there's going to be an absence. It doesn't say that it's going to be easy. The world will look at the struggle and find, and find that the perseverance of our continued efforts in the face of exhaustion, unthinkable. When as, uh, we as Christians experience trouble or trials like the world does, yet refuse to give up, it displays our reliance on God. When we, allow, when we do not allow our situations to diminish the works of God in our lives, we bring Him glory and show His power to others. One of the main reasons that my family is here at Faith Journey is perseverance. Because when things didn't go planned, we didn't give up, we got up. We didn't view setbacks uh, as, as, as opportunities to say, you know what, that's not in the stars for us. We use setbacks as setups for comebacks. 
And we began working on the recipe of perseverance. And what Paul ends up talking about here, and when he's talking to Timothy, he says, hey, I know my focus was on finishing the race. I know my focus was pressing on. I had this vision of something. I was attacking it. I was resilient. I was tenacious. I had a lot of grit. I had a lot of determination. I had a lot of endurance. And what he says to Timothy is, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've remained faithful. I've endured. Moments that require perseverance show us why 